All right, guess what, everybody? We got another person coming in saying, go nil panic and the billion dollar mistake. I don't know about you, but I have this book. A little nice reading, 100 go mistakes and how to avoid them. Good book here. Let's see what they have to say, okay? Let's see what they have to say. At my job, we have a few dozen development teams and a handful doing Go. The rest are doing Kotlin with Spring. I am a big fan of Go, and honestly, you know Go. It doesn't make sense to me to ever use the JVM, Java Virtual Machine, on which Kotlin apps run again. So I started push within the company for the other teams to start using Go too. And a few started new projects with Go to try it out. Sounds like a positive, nice story, by the way. Also really cool that this guy had enough sway to be able to get some projects started out with Go. Fast forward a few few months and the team who maintains the subscription service has their first go app live it basically a microservice which lets you get user subscription information when calling with a user id the user information is fetched from the db in the call but since we only have a few subscription plans they are loaded once during startup to keep in memory and refresh in the background every few hours fast forward again this by the way cache and validation is extremely hard okay whenever i hear this i it immediately i mean at least the guy's realistic about it they have enough subscriptions that they can keep all the subscriptions in memory. Hand-rolled Redis. Easy enough, right? I feel bad just saying that out loud. <laughs> Fast forward a few weeks again, and we are about to go live with the new subscription plan. It's loaded into the subscription service database with flag visible equals false and would be brought live later by setting it to true and refreshing the cache data in the app. The data was inserted into the database in the afternoon. Some tests were performed and everything looked fine. By the way, this is what is called a shadow traffic test, which should be being performed here. If you're creating a whole new rewrite of a service, you take a request and you replay it against your new service, ensuring that throughout, say, like a week, you return the same results every every time or the differentiation between your two services is known and that's expected and that happens. I'm back today from my miserable life only to be lightened up by your L tags. <laughs> Okay, first off, that was not an L tag what I just said there. That was great advice, so you can shut the hell up. And second off, let's see what happens. Later that day in the evening, the traffic is the highest. One by one, the instances of the app trigger and the background task to reload the subscription data from the DB and crash. The instances try to start again, but they load data from the DB during startup two and crash again. Within minutes, zero instances are available and our entire service goes down for users. Alerts go off, people get paged, the support team is very confused because there hasn't been a code change in weeks, so nothing to roll back, and the IT team is brought in to debug and fix the issue. In the end, our service was down for a little over an hour with an estimated revenue loss of $100,000. Let's just let that one sit for a second. Can we get some Fs in the chat? Fs for $100,000? Feels a little bad, huh? So what happened? When inserting the new subscription into the database, some information was unknown and set to null. The app using using a pointer for these optional fields, and while transforming the data from the database struct into another struct used in the API endpoints, a nil D reference happened. Loser. Uh, by the way, this is one reason why options are single-handedly the greatest. There is no greater decision made than to have a nil pointer wrapped in an option with a programmable interface to it. And then second, that decoding JSON is validation. Now, Go does the first one very, very well. Decoding JSON is validation, but it doesn't have an option. Options are so good. Sounds like they kind of did the microservice thing kind of wrong. Yeah, well, I mean, the, obviously they made mistakes, but an option is single-handedly the greatest data structure for professional programming ever. Oh, hold on. We got ourselves a problem. Someone's saying we got to do some ban. What are we banning? Who are we banning? Who are we banning? Who, who are we banning? Who are we banning? Who are we banning? Who are we banning? Def code? Okay, def code. We got it. I'm all over it. Def code. Bam. Got him. G get the hell out of here. Didn't even look at what you said. Get him. Got him. Yeah, so I was like, what do you say? And people were all like screaming like, get him out! And I didn't even look at him, but I did that. You know that scene in 300 where he kicks the guy? The same thing. Like identical, okay? He's fall <laughs> fallen backwards right out the door. You know what I said to him as he fell on the ground? Don't let the ground hit you on the way out. The app panicked and quit, and when starting up, the app got the same nil issue again and just panicked immediately too. Yeah, I mean, this is one of Go's, I really, it's sad due to the time period in which Go was created, in which options weren't like maybes, options, non-null, whatever you call them, nullables, or whatever stupid phrase you want to speak of them as, weren't really part of the mainstream programming world, and that's one thing I wish Go just enforced. There's a couple things I wish they enforced, like, you know, maps, maps, you can't have maps default value being nil is emotionally painful. We've all made that mistake and you just have to learn from that mistake.
You know, what's an option? It's a monad, duh. It's a burrito. Everybody knows about burritos, you know, all right? Naturally, many things went wrong here. An inexperienced team using Go in production for a critical app while they hardly had any experience using a pointer field without a nil check, not manually refreshing the cache data after inserting it into the database, having no runbook ready to revert the data insertion and notify support staff of the data change. Or shall I say shadow traffic, shadow shadow test people, okay? Just do it. You should always do that when you rewrite. Just make sure the thing is the thing. But the Kotlin guys were uh, very fast to point out that this would never happen in a Kotlin or JVM app. First, in Kotlin, null is explicit. So null dereference cannot happen accidentally unless you're using Java code together with Kotlin code. This is facts. I was about to say, what do you mean? What, what the hell do you even mean? But also when you get a null pointer exception in the background thread, only the thread is killed and not the entire app. And even then, most mechanisms to run background tasks have error recovery built in in the form of try catch around the whole job yeah this this whole try catch business it's just it's honestly the worst it's honestly the worst to me this was a big eye-opener i'm pretty experienced with go and was previously recommending it to everyone now i'm not so sure anymore what are your thoughts on it this is actually a really it's a really good a really good suggestion it's a really good story obviously skill issues plague everybody anyone who thinks that some other language or some other construct is going to prevent you from having errors is kind of silly right there's so many things you can do wrong with rust like the amount of times I have personally written or have personally seen somebody due to how Rust requires you to write things, have all these Tokyo threads running just for it to all funnel down to a single map with a mutex around it. I've done that. I've skill issued myself constantly in Rust. Rust is a one giant skill issue nonstop all the time, always and forever. I still skill issue myself. The thing about JavaScript that makes it so squirrely, even with TypeScript support so you get warned about the potential of null, is that you also have to know that there's a potential of null. Also, JSON parsing is not validation. You can JSON parse anything, and what ends up coming out is an any. And that's really important to know because if you return from a function with a signature and it's an any, or on the other hand, you return a JSON parse out of a function in which the definition says, I'm a foo, it will automatically assign a foo and it will be guaranteed to be a foo because it has an implicit any on the JSON return. Like it's not easy. There's a lot of validation you have to do. Every single function in JavaScript that has the word await in it could possibly throw that's also very, very difficult. There's lots of foot guns in every single language and each one has a different set of foot guns. So is Go somehow better or worse than Kotlin? I don't think so. Panic only kills the Go routine it happened in. Interesting, okay. Skill issues should have read effective Go before migrating crucial microservices. Yeah, okay, that's fair. I, I would definitely say one of the biggest things that they obviously did wrong is they found their one of their most critical services. They ran no shadow traffic, and they had a bunch of rookies that have never written Go write it. Like, did did all the rookies become mid-level engineers afterwards? Yeah, they're probably actually really adept now with Go, and they probably will never make the same mistake again. Yes. That sounds great. Let's see, we do need to throw an option type into the core and be done with it. You can totally write one. You just need to standardize. Also, uh, don't do the previous 15 fuck ups. <laughs> Yes. Most, I mean, option type would be great. You just, you will never mess up again a nil, right? It'll be fantastic. If there was some sort of option type, you can just guarantee from here on out, beautiful, right? I think we all agree to that. Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> but it's so true. You can still, there's so many runtime errors that you will make no matter the language. What's an option type? An option type is really, really simple. I didn't know what an option type was until I started using Rust. And so an option type is a very, very simple item. It's an, it's an option with a generic value underneath. And it has two values. It can either be none or it can be sum with that, whatever that generic is as its value, right? We'll call it T, right? So whatever, we'll call it T. That's, well, now we're an I. Thank you, everybody, we're an I. So that's its two values. That means if you have a nil, it is none. If you have a sum, it is something. So underlying in the memory, what you're gonna have is you're gonna have the tag and then you're gonna have the space for however big I is which means that if you have a none, you're gonna have something that looks like this, a tag zero plus all the space. Now I know this isn't technically true. Technically, if you have a none first, it has this like memory optimization trick, but just deal with it, okay? Nonetheless, you can never run into a nil pointer because there is no such thing as a nil pointer because everything has a type and this thing is a type. So for you to get the value out, you have to do some sort of pattern matching or some sort of like accessing. And so this is what something, it, it, 
it's it's very very fantastic you there is no such thing as a nil because it has a typed wrap around it to prevent the entire idea of null so good like okay so why would you ever use this very very simple let's say you have some json and you have a, a field called a and a may or may not be there well you can do what you do in javascript and have a question mark or you can do what you do in other languages and you have an option with the type inside of it that means you have a type in which you need to handle or in the case of TypeScript, you have a linter that lets you know that this thing could be undefined. And so the idea of having it as a type means that it's significantly more strict. Like you can't access the underlying value without first going through the type. And that's called a lift operation or a catamorphic operation. <laughs> I know a word or two in the functional world. <laughs> I know word. I know big words. I'm surprised they don't see more use. There are null types you can use when deserializing DB records. They live alongside a squeal package. There's also a version which works with JSON YAML too. Again, pointers are still widely idiomatic, but it's something to investigate. Mostly, I think having years of experience helps the Kotlin team at least as much as the features. Being new to something is always harder. This is such a great point. I mean, is this surprising at all? Should you ever be surprised that you can run into dumb problems? Like unless if the language strictly forbades it, right? So Rust would be a language that strictly forbades a null pointer problem. But you can still, in unsafe Rust, you can still null pointer yourself. But generally, you can't null pointer yourself. Like, it's just forbidden in safe Rust. And so unless if you have that, you're gonna, you're, it's gonna happen. Do we have any other fun ones? As someone who works in a programming language design, I have to agree with them. Nil and generally zero values feel like big errors in the design of Go. Every other language designed in the last 25 years have found a solution to this problem. So I can't understand why Go's designers decided to make this choice. I don't know about the last 25 years. You know, I don't know if 1999 we fixed the null problem. Can someone tell me what happened in 1999? that made people want to fix the null problem. Seems kind of wild. Party like it's 1990, the Y2K came in. Yeah, I know, Y2K baby. All right, hold on, someone said something about management. Maybe there's a management process issue here too. Do you really start your team's first real experience with a new language by having them code public-facing revenue critical app? <laughs> <laughs> if I say the word shadow traffic one more time, I feel like you guys are going to punch me and quit listening to me. But real talk, just effing use shadow traffic if you rewrite a surface. Oh my goodness, it's just like, come on. People! Like OP mentioned, there were other processes slash checks that would have caught this regardless of the team being new to go or not. If this was the first time a new subscription was added, it should have been done in a test environment first, especially if you're inserting null data where it's available on every other subscription. And it's generally a better practice to have non-null defaults in your database to ensure your app handles those default values. Yes, this is a great point. Null values are just effing dangerous and to begin with. Just don't have null values. Somebody please, what is shadow traffic? Shadow traffic is really simple. If you're ever building a new service that is a rewrite of an old service, why is shadow traffic so important? So what happens right now today is you're gonna have your old service right here, right? Your old service is gonna take in some sort of HTTP request coming in, whatever it is, and it's gonna respond with some data, whatever that data is. A shadow request is pretty simple, is you take your new service and you actually take this request and you split it off and hit your new service. Your new service then responds also, and it has what it responds with. You're gonna take this data and store it somewhere, and then, or you live compare it at the point of completion. And you just say, hey, how is new service doing? Is new service doing a good job? Is new service responding the same way as old service? It's like a canary, except for it's not serving any real world traffic. It's not a comparison of real world, it's a comparison of is this thing ready for the real world. And this is an extremely effective technique to make sure that whatever you've made is the same as the old version. Okay, well, I think we've talked that one to death. The name is the primogen.